Good morning. There we go. Good to be with you this morning. Um, we are, uh, teens are away today at a retreat, and so we um, want to remember to pray for them. Uh, as hopefully you've been kind of watching a little bit about what's happening at Asbury, uh, the revival that's been going on there. It's on Facebook. It's on um, different places. It just found me all week long praying that somehow God would break in for our kids. Amen to that. Um, what they really need is just more of him, just like us. So this morning, um, in just a few moments, we're going to receive our morning tithes and offerings. If you have the connection card that's with you, anything that we can pray for you about, anything that's going on in your world um, that we can be on our knees for you, if you just fill that out, leave it in the offering plate, we will make sure this week to be praying for you. Anything you need from us, any way we can follow up with you, provide information for you, get you connected to a community on mission or plug you into serving, or if you want to know more about Jesus, if you would let us know, we will follow up with you absolutely this week. Um, fill those out, prepare those. I have just a few announcements for you as you are doing that. Um, on March 3rd is going to be a tween half-nighter. It's not going to be an all-nighter because then, you know, I wouldn't be able to go and serve at it because I'm too old for that. So if you know a tween, they're not quite elementary students, they're not quite teenagers yet. Um, if your grandparents or parents of a tween, uh, we now know definitively that somewhere around 10 to 11, a child's mind is developing more than an infant to a one-year-old. It's such a critical time in their lives. It's actually the time that we now know that faith is formed, that their worldview is set and established. This is such an important time in a child's life. We often think that it's in their teen years, but by the time they're 14, 15, and 16, all of that has already happened. When they're 10 and 11, this is the moment. So if you have a tween, it's really important to us that we somehow um, begin to minister and be aware of that reality so that we can disciple folks at the right time along with what God is up to. So if you have a tween, bring them. It's going to be a blast. There's going to be a lot of fun. I promise they will come back tired, but filled with good stories as well. So show up for that. And then on March 5th, we will be taco, tacoing about it. Uh, this is just our annual meeting. We will have tacos after the service together. And several really important things are going to happen. This is in two weeks. You'll, we'll celebrate together everything God has done this year. We'll talk about where God is leading us in the future. And at that time, you'll get to affirm our new board members, our new elders. We have um, three this year that are, are rolling off. And we have hopefully four, I'm still praying, that we'll have four brand new ones. Brand new folks that will be coming. So we want to honor those that have served us really, really well. And we will do that on the 5th. And we also want to welcome and affirm the new board members that will be joining with us. So if you, if Aurora is your home, if this is your church, on that day we'll invite you to affirm the leadership that God is sending. Board members are really, really important for us. In the Church of Nazarene, we call them board members. I like to say elders because there's a spiritual representation as well. They're not just fiduciary leaders here. They are people who love Jesus first, for whom Jesus is actually Lord. People who are sold out to the mission of helping heaven break into our neighborhood. People who love Aurora, but they love Aurora third. They love Jesus first. They love his mission, and they love Aurora. My desire is this. When I meet brand new people who don't know Jesus, and they finally say to me, man, what does it look like to follow this Jesus? That's kind of weird that I could point to any one of our board members and say, just follow them around for a few months, and you'll know exactly what it looks like. So on that day, we are affirming these people have been prayed over. These people have been reviewed. We've had conversations with them. The board has collectively said these people are... God's kind of folks for us, but it's really important that you all would say, yeah, we agree. These are the kind of leaders that God has and we will follow. So that day is really important. So be with us on the 5th. We're going to have tacos. We're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to celebrate together, but that's what's going to be happening on that day. If our ushers would come, let's receive our morning tithes and offerings together. Heavenly Father, you have given to us so, 
so generously above and beyond anything that we could ever hope or imagine. And Lord, you've called us to be the same kind of folks that we would give generously, not because we have to, but because you have given to us more than we could ever give back to you. So I pray now that you would take everything that we have to offer you, every single thing. Would you bless it? Would you multiply it for your kingdom's sake? We love you, Lord, and we ask in your name. Amen. It is so good to be with you. Yeah, let's, you could turn that up. Maybe. So all month long, we've been talking about relationships, and essentially, here's what we've said. None of us have ideal ones. All all of us have real ones, except for Sue Ann. She has the perfect ideal relationship. (laughs) We we begin relationships um, in, in bigger terms than just marriage, right? Anywhere there's people who do life together in any way, there's relationships. So teams that you join have coaches, and they have players, and they have fans, and they have opponents, right? There's all kinds of relationships in that. Every time you go to work, there's a boss. There's maybe a board. There's constituents. There's customers. There's coworkers. Anywhere you go, if you go to your own neighborhood, there's neighbors. There's probably a police officer. There's probably a postman. Anywhere you go, there are relationships. And all of us begin relationships with the ideals. So, you know, it's easy to kind of think about marriage, but let's think about all relationships. If you start a brand new job, here's usually the way we start it. I'm going to go to this new job, and I'm going to make more money. Ah. But not only am I going to make more money, it's bigger than that. I'm going to go to this new job, I'm going to make more money, but I'm going to work less hours. Yeah. But I'm not going to make more money, I'm going to work less hours, but I'm also going to be appreciated far more than I am now. But not only more money and less hours and more appreciation, I'm also going to become famous. I can't wait for my new job. Woo! And then you go to the new job, and guess what happens when you get to the new job? That job also has a boss. Shoot! They also have coworkers. Come on! There's also a list of responsibilities and obligations. There's also, you know, it's called work for a reason. There's work. I know it's weird, but people pay you to work. And so you get there, and all of a sudden, all of the dreams that you had, you now want them to be realized. And over the last couple of weeks, here's, here's what we've been saying. Um, it's this strange insidious thing that happens. And just so you know, it's not because we're bad people, it's because sin is real. It's because evil exists. And, and evil is so, so insidious. We like to think that evil is, you know, people who do really bad things on the news. But evil is far more pervasive than that because it's in us. Here's what happens. All of our dreams that are really good, there's nothing bad about wanting to, to work and make money. In fact, John Wesley, any, any John Wesley fans? Our whole Nazarene movement is based on the theology of, John, theology of John Wesley. John Wesley said every Christian everywhere should make as much money as possible. That's what he said, not me. And then he goes on to say, and you should spend as little as possible and you should give away as much as possible. He also said that, but he he believed that money wasn't evil. In fact, it should be in the hands of God's trusted stewards so we could steward it. There's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with wanting to have an appropriate work-life balance. There's not even anything wrong with wanting to be famous. But 
When those things don't begin to happen, something happens in me, and I take all of my dreams and my desires, and I place them on you. And I make my dream fulfillment your responsibility, or my wife's, or my children's. And guess what happens whenever you make somebody else responsible for your desires? In that moment, you have stopped treating them like a human and started treating them like an object. When you are only as good as you can fulfill what I want to happen, you are a tool to me. You are an object to me. And all of us, all of the time, are on the verge of taking people that we love the most, people that we have committed our lives to, and we objectify them. Anytime that my dreams become your responsibility, you stop being a person to whom I relate, you become an object with whom I interact. And what you already know, deep down inside, none of us desire to be objectified. None of us want to be objectified. That's why in Seattle, we really resist, right, being put into any box. We resist it. If I said to all of you right now, hey, could you raise your hands for me? Half of you would go, nope, just because you asked, not doing it. Uh Uh-uh. Like, Deep down in the core of who we are as Seattleites is do not objectify me. And actually, deep down in the core of who you are as a human says the same thing. You are not an object. You're not a human doing. You're not just what you can produce. You are a human being. And scripturally, and in this place of faith, you are a human who is created in the very image of God, and the image of God is to be in perfect, loving growing, fruitful relationship. Relationships that grow and fulfill and provide more enjoyment than in the past. However, there is this strange reality that happens. And it came out for me in this conversation I was having with a couple that's been married for a long time. I love to, I love, you ever um, go somewhere and see you know, older couples holding hands. Just like seeing a child running to their parents, there's just something about it. It's so delightful. It's so inspiring. So I, I found myself in this conversation, and I saw this cute little couple, and, and they graciously began to engage, and I was just asking, you know, how long have you been married, and how's that going, you know, marriage for a lifetime, and what's that all about, and, and you know, how have things been? Has it ever been hard? All the married people in the room are just laughing. You're all laughing. <laughs> they didn't laugh. They actually um, began to tear up a little bit. And he kind of glanced sideways at her, and she squeezed his hand, and he began to recount some of the painful moments. And they didn't go into details, but it was clear that they went through a season where they wanted to have more children, and they couldn't. And then he got a little choked up and she took over. And she said it was really difficult because every single time we began to have a a conversation with each other, one of us would make the other feel like they were the problem. And it didn't matter how we engaged and what side we came from and, and how sensitive we tried to be, it just landed in the other person on both sides as if they were the reason dreams weren't fulfilled. And it found us hurting So I asked, I said, well, in the moment where your dreams weren't being fulfilled, what did you do? And then he piped it back up and he said, well, we do what every American does. We distracted ourselves with everything we could. We traveled more. We bought another house. We found new friends. We did new entertainments. We we busied ourselves like crazy. And she said, "Um, but it made things worse. I said, what do you mean it made things worse? She said, well, now, we're committed to each other. 
But all of a sudden, we had a relationship we didn't sign up for. We had dreams that were unmet, and yet we didn't know what to do. And then she said, we had to find a better way. And so, um, being the nosy guy that I am, I couldn't help it. I finally asked. I said, well, why didn't you just leave? Why did you stay together? And in that moment, they both began to laugh. Now remember, I was younger, and they thought I was foolish. And finally she said to me, Jimmy, if you think some dream fulfillment machine exists out there, you're crazy. But for you and I, isn't it normally what we do in this world, in this space, in this time? If you don't speak my truth, I'm out. Isn't that true? If you don't carry my agenda, see ya. And what they began to just share with me was, that's fine, and you can try that, but if you go to a new job, guess what you're going to find? A boss. Mm Mm-hmm. Boss is going to be there. You go to a new marriage, it's okay, but guess what? There's going to be somebody else in that marriage. You go to a new team, a new school. You're still going to find yourself at some moment, and please don't misunderstand, please don't misunderstand, there are times when you need to change jobs. There are, legitimately times. There are times when you need to move neighborhoods, legitimately. There are times you need to, right? There are times. But here's what they were saying to me. Even when you change, there's going to be a moment in that new relationship when your dreams are not fulfilled. The question is, what do we do in that moment? Because if all we do is change, we'll never get past this reality. Our dreams don't always come true. Boy, I should be writing slogans for Hallmark, right? Doesn't that sound great? Dreams don't always come true. Aren't you glad you came to church? Isn't this awesome? If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open them up to 1 Peter. It's in the New Testament, or turn your phones on. It's in the New Testament. If you get to Revelation, you've gone a little too far. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, you need to go a little bit farther. Um, 1 Peter is written by Peter himself. Peter is a follower of Jesus. He um, is rough and tough and always ready to rumble. He's the guy that sliced off Malchus's ear in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus, right? Really good fisherman, really bad soldier, right? <laughs> Not very good with the sword aim. He's the guy that was rebuked by Jesus to his face. Woo. He's the guy that Jesus said, upon this declaration, I will build my church. He changed his name from Simon, Jesus did, in that moment, to Cephas, or Peter, which means the rock. Peter is a guy, and he knows what it is to have dreams go unfulfilled. So he writes this letter, and and fascinatingly enough, so here's, here's where he's writing. He's actually writing from Rome which he, in, in, in his own letter, will call Babylon. Babylon is just like the, um, it's the image that the biblical writers would use for the oppressive group. He calls it Babylon, and he's writing from Rome, and he's actually not even writing. He's aged now, and he's in prison now, and, and so a guy named Sylvanus is actually penning for him the words that he speaks. And he's writing not to Jewish people, but to folks like us, to Gentile people who were outside of the first covenant that God had, right, to people who have come to the faith. And he begins the, the, the letter by reminding them that they belong to a new family, that they actually are members of the family, that they're not slaves or servants, but they are heirs to the kingdom. 
He reminds them that they have a brand new identity. They are children of God in a brand new hope, that they've been born into the living hope that is Christ Jesus, he says, that someday Jesus will actually return and the perfect love of God will reign supreme. Amen to that? That is the hope that we have. And then he goes into this middle section, and and this isn't our text for today, but it sets up the text for today, which is fascinating to me. Peter goes into the section about oppression and suffering. And their oppression was different than ours, but let me just say this. When you find yourselves in a relationship where dreams aren't fulfilled, it's oppressive. For the couple that I talked to, they openly would say, it wasn't anybody's fault. It's nobody's fault. And yet it was there. Our dreams were broken, unfulfilled. If you go back through the pandemic, right, uh, companies were closing, churches were shutting down all around the nation. Whose fault was it? No one's. But it still meant all these dreams were unfulfilled. Hurt still had to be managed. And when you find yourself in that moment, it can be oppressive. Peter knew what it was to have dreams unfulfilled. He finds himself imprisoned, believing that Jesus was the Son of God, that he was going to bring in the kingdom of God. His first thought was that somehow he would be, you know, God's right-hand man, that he would be in power. (laughs) Instead, he finds himself imprisoned, dreams unfulfilled. And the first thing that Peter teaches us reveals to us in his own life and his own writing is this. Often we come to God as if he's the great dream fulfiller in the sky. Lord, if you would just, you know, let my son be the star of the play. If you would just let me get the promotion. Lord, if you would just let her say yes. (laughs) And Peter says to us that God is actually up to something much bigger than granting my wishes and yours. In fact, he's up to something so big. Here's what's strange. Here's what's weird. In this whole section uh, of his writing, in the middle section, here's what he says. Somehow in the sufferings of God is actually the grace and the goodness of God. It's actually a gift that God gives us that we should lean into that we should actually lean into the suffering. Which I just love to remind Sue Ann, when I'm not perfect for her and I bring suffering, I'm like, I'm just giving you a gift from God. That's all I'm doing. Okay, I don't really do that. Don't do that in your marriages. Don't say that. But Peter actually says to us that somehow suffering for us is a gift. And here's why. Because somehow through suffering and oppression, and I know this sounds weird, but it refines us and causes us to let go of all the superfluous things that we would put our hope in instead of the living hope who is Christ Jesus. Have you ever noticed that you pray the hardest when things get difficult? Have you ever noticed that? How about this one? Some of you are going through this right now. Do you know that two in 10 Americans have any purpose for their living? Did you know that? Two out of 10 Americans, 20% of Americans say, I have any purpose in my life. Did you know over 70% of cancer survivors have a very clear purpose for their life? Did you know that? Here's my prayer for all of you, that you would get cancer. That's my prayer for you, because somehow there's a gift in suffering. It clarifies, it causes us. Here's what happens for me. When I pray, Lord, would you please help my kids to you know, get all A's and to be the you know, prom king? I'm tempted to put my trust in how happy my children are. And so God goes, no, I'm actually gonna give them your talent and your popularity. They're not gonna be any of those things. And it reminds me not to even put my trust in good things, but to put them only in God. Because only God can fully fulfill. It is God who we need and God alone. 
Every time we go through suffering, there's an opportunity for us to be refined and to more deeply put our hope in the only one who can carry it. Here's what Paul says, then we'll get into our verses, I promise. I'm just going to read these to you in, in chapter 4 before ours. He says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trials you are suffering as though something strange was happening to you. We're tempted to do this all the time. If you're a Christian and you love Jesus and you get into marriage and it's ever hard, then you go, ah! I must have messed up. I must not really be a Christian. Paul's like, don't be surprised. Life's hard. Relationships are hard. In fact, in that moment of it being difficult is a great gift for you because you get to choose and you get to place your trust in the only one who can fulfill and sustain any relationship or any life anywhere, and his name is Jesus. Don't be surprised. Don't be shocked. People sometimes come to me as a pastor and want to talk about something and really they want to confess something that's going on, and every single time they do, I'm like, oh, no, I I don't. I'm just like, okay. And almost every time, there's this sense of relief. And they're like, why aren't you shocked? They're like, because life is hard. Because sin is real. But grace is bigger. Because we have hope. Not some fanciful fairy tale hope, but living hope in Jesus Christ who is alive in this moment and promises that he will come back. And one day, his perfect love will reign for us. Don't be shocked. We're not shocked. But instead, he says, rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. So what do you do? What do you do when you find yourself in a place where your dreams aren't being fulfilled? He goes on and he begins to talk about what this should look like. And he talks about elders, and he talks about shepherds, and then he begins to talk to young people. But it's for all of us. Here's what he says. All of you should clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. Now, he gives the reason. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Let me just say it like this. Um, If you think your spouse is really a problem, wait till your spouse is talking about you to somebody else. That's all I'm saying, right? If you really think that your your kid's teacher is the problem, just wait till that teacher's talking about your kid, right? Just we all need, we, we, we have got to approach life with a lot of humility. We used to have a general superintendent that would say, if you need to come and place anybody on the altar today, just come in the humility of knowing they're placing you on some altar somewhere. (laughs) Right? We just have to come with humility. When it comes to politics, when it comes to the new election cycle, my prayer for us at Aurora is this, that every relationship would be bigger than any politic. Because we gotta be humble. I don't see politics very well. I see it very selfishly and very narrowly, but I don't see it very well. I'm not smart enough for that. I'm not big enough for that. I don't have a big enough experience, but probably neither do you. We just have got to approach life with humility. But then he gives a very biblical reason that terrifies me, because God opposes the proud. I don't know about you, but I don't want to look on the other sidelines and see God over there. I want to be on the same sidelines with God. You, You know what I'm saying? I do not want God opposing me, but he's just open. God opposes the proud, but he gives grace. He gives grace to the humble. Remember, theologically, grace isn't just some soppy um, nicety. Grace is power to do for you what you could never do for yourself. That's what grace is, but gives grace. He will do for you what you're unable to do for yourself in humility. The only posture by which we can enter the kingdom of heaven is humility. It's the only one. There is no other option. But here's the awesome thing. When we come humbly, God does for us what we could never do for ourselves. He's he's already going to accomplish that. When you enter the kingdom and bring your relationships with you humbly, he does for you what you couldn't do for yourself. That's what grace is all about. 
So humble yourselves, verse 6, under the mighty power of God, for at just the right time, he will lift you up. Guess what this phrase actually is? He will submit. He will lift you up. The image here is this, that we would come to God humbly, like this. That we would bow, that we would be low. And at just the right time, Paul says, he will lift you up. He will do for you what you can't do for yourself. And then he gives the practical advice. Verse 7. Because of all this, cast all of your cares on him. Because he cares for you. You know the reason that God wants to grace you? It's because he cares for you. You know the reason he wants you to come to him humbly? Because he cannot wait to be with you. Do you know the reason he's given any instructions to us at all is because his way is the best way and he loves us so much. He wants us to be as blessed as absolutely possible. He cares for you. King David said it like this. Psalm 37, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. When your heart begins to desire the Lord, you'll discover your desires are fulfilled. Because he'll never withhold himself from you. He'll never hide. He'll never shade. He'll never... um, hold you hostage with, well, you can only have me if. When you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give himself fully to you and your heart will be fulfilled. Jesus said it like this, Matthew 7. If we know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more will our perfect heavenly father bless his own children? See, God desires to love you, to bless you, to grace you. What he needs is for us to stop carrying it all on our own. When you find that you have desires that have been unmet, dreams that are unfulfilled, instead of trying to solve them in your own strength with a new job, new career, new place, new relationships, instead you would take all of those things that you might even go, if you find yourself in a Christian environment at work, that you might go together and you would cast them on the Lord instead of carrying them yourself because he cares for you and he has so much grace to do for you what you could never do for yourself. And what you'll discover is this. Often in the moments where your dreams are unmet, when you cast them on the Lord, you begin to see the dreams that he's dreamed for you become your own. Before I left the couple, I turned back around and said, thank you. And then I I said, I should probably just ask you what's happened since. And they said, oh, we've adopted nine children and we're counselors for couples who can't have children. Because when I cast my cares upon God, when I give him all of my dreams that are unfulfilled, he replaces them with his dreams that have yet to be accomplished. This morning as the worship team comes, I'm going to invite you to see this whole place as a place of prayer. The word this morning isn't really something that you need to hear so much as something you need to do. And I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure there are a lot of unfulfilled dreams in the room. Perhaps your marriage isn't exactly what you wanted. Perhaps your kids didn't turn out the exact way you wished they would. Perhaps the world isn't going the way, whatever it is. 
this morning, the question isn't, does God love you? It's not, does he have grace for you? The question is, will you stop carrying and start casting them on him? So this morning, I'm just going to begin by a word of prayer. And then we just want to open the altars. If you'd like to come pray here, I'd love to pray with you. So Anne will come. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe you need to come um, with a son or a daughter or a friend or a coworker or a spouse and just come and collectively say, you're not the problem, I'm not the problem, but there is something going on that only God could solve. Here's the good news. He gives grace to the humble. To the humble. So this morning, whatever you need, however you need it, if you just need to pray right where you're at, that's awesome. For those of you that are online, I'd love for you to find some kind of space where you could bow, where you could be at some sort of altar, and you could just spend time with your Heavenly Father because He cares for you. All of your concerns, all of your anxiety, all of that, He actually says, bring it to me. Bring it to me because I've got grace for all of that because I care that much for you. The time is yours. Would you do exactly what he asks you to do? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that speaks to me. Thank you for sending Jesus to this place for the living hope that we now know. Thank you for sending your spirit that it fills us and empowers us to actually trust your way is the best way. So now, Lord, with altars open, would you hear our prayers? Would you receive all of our cares and all of our anxiety, all of our unmet desires and unfulfilled dreams? Would you receive them? And Lord, would you replace them with your grace and the dreams that you've dreamed over us? Would you be God? Would you come and pray?